Let's pray. Dear God, we come before you tonight, and our hearts are bowed down to you, and we're in awe uh, that you would create us and that you would create this earth for us, and we're in awe of your power and your glory and your majesty. We're so thankful for all that you do for us on a daily basis. Uh, When we sing songs like that, dear God, we're filled with a mixture of emotions, and we're so overwhelmed and thankful that you sent your son to this earth to die for us. But we're ashamed, dear God, for all the times that we fail and we don't live up to that sacrifice, and we're guilty of uh, putting your son on that cross. We're so thankful for his willingness to come and die for us, uh, for the love that that he had for us, and we pray that uh, now that we've experienced that love, that we would share it with others and do what we can to, to help them experience the same. We're so thankful for the opportunity to worship you tonight, dear God, and we pray that all that we do will please you and that it will be in spirit and in truth. And we're so thankful for your word and all that it uh, teaches us and how it guides us through our lives. And we we pray that we would also share that with with those that are around us. Uh, We pray that you would continue to bless this congregation and all the, the congregations of your church that meet around the area, and we pray that it would continue to grow and that it would continue to reach those who are lost. Uh, We pray that you would forgive us when we fail you, dear God, and that you would continue to bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. Number 551. Number 551. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, set them in pity from sin and the grave. We for the erring one, lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus the mighty to save. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, Jesus is merciful. Number 553, 553.
The invitation song will be number 255, 255. Get one of them podiums over here and just bring it over here. While he's getting the podium, uh, you know, y'all are sitting so far back there. Instead of me staying up here, I'm going to move down here. Uh, I know whenever... Uh, you go into the Old Testament and the Israelites, whenever some of them had leprosy, uh, they were put without the camp. Well, I don't think that I have leprosy. And so I'm going to get within the camp to where that we're in here and everybody's together. Uh, you know, I, I like it whenever we're able to be together and we're not having to uh, separate ourselves. Uh, this is a big group of people. The place that I come from, a little place called Fulbright, uh, on, a, on a good Sunday, we have about 24 and so, uh, you know, we've got a big group. And so I, I like it to be, be close with each other. You know, I, I can't, I don't know if from our building, if from the pulpit to where uh, we are on the first row here, is, uh, that may be as deep as it is in the building where we're at. And so y'all way back here, it kind of gets a long ways away. So let's get down here where we'll be close to each other and we'll be able to deal with the lesson that I, I have for this evening. Before we begin, if you don't have an outline for several years now, uh, there at home, what I do is whenever I make a lesson, I also make an outline. And the outline is handed out. Uh, actually, it's on the table and they can pick it up, but the outline is there to be picked up. And I found that it makes it a whole lot better so that folks can kind of take some notes. Uh, I'm, I'm accused of going too fast sometimes whenever I get into some of the scriptures and going through them so fast that folks can't find them and read them. And so uh, this gives you an opportunity to be able to write them down, and if you need to, go back and read them later. Uh, I'll try not to go so fast tonight to where that if you want to uh, follow along, you can. But we do have several things that we want to talk about. Uh, I want to thank Dale and Elizabeth. Uh, Elizabeth is uh, Della's cousin, and uh, she asked us if we would come over and eat supper tonight. And so the lesson may be awful short because I'm awful full. Uh, she did a wonderful job and appreciate her feeding us. Appreciate the congregation here asking me to come and to speak. I really enjoy being able to speak. There are a lot of people here that I know, uh, a lot of family, and then different ones that I've met. We've met here some whenever we came before, uh, my wife and I and the boys. We've got three boys. We have been here before, and so it's good to see those that we've met before and then see those that are friends that we haven't seen in a long time and be able to see them. My understanding is, is we're talking about the kings. Is that right? 
And I don't know what kings you have actually studied so far, but whenever we came up with kings and Dale asked me, I asked him, I said, well, what king are you going to put me with? And he said, well, you can kind of choose uh, whichever one you want. And I said, well, I want Hezekiah. And I, I like Hezekiah. He's a king that, uh, that, that I think that I can connect with uh, because there's some things in his life that I think that uh, I can see where he can help me in my life. And so I think Hezekiah is a really good king to study. If you have your Bibles and you want to follow along, we're going to read a passage of Scripture. I'm going to give you a bunch of references, and we're going to paraphrase them, but we're not going to read uh, that many because i got a lot of things I want to say after we get through with the verses uh, that, that, that we need to get into. But if you will, turn to the book of Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 38, and I want us to look in verses 1 down through verse 8. And we're going to read all eight of these verses. It says, In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amoz, came unto him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed unto the Lord and said, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. Then came the word of the Lord to Isaiah saying, Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David, thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will add unto thy days Fifteen years, and I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city. And this shall be a sign unto thee from the Lord, that the Lord will do this thing that he has spoken. Behold, I will bring again the shadow of the degree which is gone down in the sundial of Ahaz ten degrees backward. So the sun returned ten degrees by which degrees it was gone down. So in other words, time went backwards ten degrees is what he's talking about there. And we think about Isaiah uh, here in Isaiah chapter 38. He speaks about Hezekiah. And Hezekiah here was one of the few good kings of Israel. There weren't that many good kings whenever you look at the kings of Israel. And as you go through and you start studying the kings of Israel, wonderful study as you talk about the kings of the northern tribe and the kings of the southern tribe and you, and you start looking at the divided kingdom and, and you look and see what all is going on and what these kings do and how they act and react to the things that are going on around them. And, and there's a lot of great lessons in there for you and for me. And so as we get ready to start into this lesson, I want us to think about Hezekiah and where we can find lessons about Hezekiah. If you go to the Bible, there's 11 different chapters, uh, major chapters that we can look at that's going to show us about King Hezekiah. If you go into the book of 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapters 18 through 20, 2 Chronicles chapter 29 through 32, and then in the book of Isaiah chapters 36 through, verse, uh, through chapter 39, you got 11 chapters there and all these 11 chapters speak a whole lot about Isaiah and the things that went on in his life uh, Hezekiah the things that went on in his life Hezekiah was uh, 25 years old when he began to reign and he reigned after those 25 years for 29 more years so he began at age 25 he ended at age 29 we know this whenever we go like into second chronicles chapter 29 and in verse 1 it tells us this now then there were four prophets that were uh, prophesied during the time of Hezekiah. And so if we want to understand something about Hezekiah, we ought to go back and look at these prophets. Well, there were four of them. There was Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea, and Micah. All four of these prophesied during the time of Hezekiah. And so we can read about those men. We can also be reading about Hezekiah. One of the reasons that Hezekiah is called a good king is because Hezekiah tore down the high places in the land uh, where idolatry had been practiced. And, and we know that by looking at 2 Kings chapter 18 and in verse 4 that he tore down those high places. In other words, those places which men had built to be able to practice their idolatry, which some of the other kings had allowed, Hezekiah comes in and Hezekiah tears down these high places. He gets rid of them so that they're not going to be doing this idolatry anymore. Now then, if we think about Hezekiah, the Bible says this. He says, And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father did. 2 Kings chapter 18 and verse 3. And so Hezekiah is trying to do 
like David had done before. That is, he's wanting to follow the Lord. He's wanting to do what the Lord would have him to do. And in the life of Hezekiah, there are lessons that you and I are going to try to learn tonight. If you'll notice, if you've got an outline, it's broken down into three different points there. It's talking about the restoration, it's talking about prayer, and then it's talking about pride. And we're going to look at those three things about Hezekiah and what are some lessons that we as young people, it's a summer youth series, we get together during the summer, we have extra time to study, extra time to learn about the Word of God. <coughs> and so we have this time together, so I want to put it down on the young people's level. Now then, I don't have a problem putting it down on your level because I'm already there. I'm not above, I'm just right there with you. Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't do the flowery speech, I don't do a lot of the things that some people do, but I'm right there right along with you. We've always been told if you put the feed down there where the calf can get it, well, the cow can get it too. Well, I try to keep it right down there where the calf can get it, and that way all the adults and everybody can understand what we're talking about. And so we're going to understand this afternoon what we can learn in these three lessons about Hezekiah. The first being restoration. What are some things that were restored? Well, Hezekiah restored temple worship. If you go back into the book of 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 29, you begin up there in about verse 3 and you go all the way down through verse 29 and we're not going to read all the verses. I'm going to kind of paraphrase some of them for you so that we can understand what Hezekiah did. In verses 3 through 5, Hezekiah, in restoring the temple, uh, the worship of the, of the temple, what he did is he brought in the priest and the Levites and he gathered them together. And he was talking to them and he told them, he said, you go out there and you sanctify yourselves and you sanctify the house of the Lord. Then whenever you drop down into verses 18 and 19, they come back, the priest and the Levites, they come back and they say, hey, we've cleansed all of the house of the Lord with all the vessels, all the things that were inside, we've cleansed all those things. They are made right that we have done what you told us to do. And then you drop down into chapter 29, verses 28 and 29, it says, all the congregation worshiped and the singers sang and the trumpeters sounded. And so here we have Hezekiah. The temple had been abused. It, it was not what it ought to be. It had been, it was no longer sanctified. And so Hezekiah says, you go in and you cleanse the temple. You get everything out of it. Well, that kind of makes me think about Jesus' cleansing of the temple whenever he made his whip and he went through and he scattered everybody in the temple that wasn't supposed to be there. Hezekiah is kind of doing the same thing, but what he's doing is, is he's taking the things that are inside and he's cleaning it out. You know, over in the... In, in some foreign countries, I know of some, uh, uh, some evangelists over there that uh, whenever they get ready to preach on Sunday morning, what they have to do is they have to get there uh, early and they have to more or less cleanse the temple because what they do is they meet in the only place that is big enough for them to meet and on Saturday night they have the beer and so they go in there and they sweep the beer cans out and they cleanse it and they take it and sweep everything out and get it cleaned up, spray around to where it smells better. They move all the tables out, the bar is pushed away to where it's not there and then the people come in and they worship. They're having to get it clean so that they can come in and worship our Lord and Savior our, our, so that they can worship God so that they can come in and they can present their worship to God as they should. Well, that's what Hezekiah is doing. He's cleansing the temple. It has been abused. It has been defiled. And so let's cleanse the temple and Hezekiah does that very thing. Now, Hezekiah not only restored uh, the, the temple worship, but he also restored the Passover. Uh, you think about the Passover, you go into the book of Chronicles, in 2 Chronicles chapter 30, verses 1 and 2, and then drop down to verses 13 through 16 in 2 Chronicles 30 there. Uh, in 2 Chronicles chapter 30, verse 1 verse, through verse 3 there, Hezekiah sent to all of Israel and to Judah, that's to the northern and the southern kingdom, and he wrote letters to them, not only to them, but also to Ephraim uh, and Manasseh, it says, and, and that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the Passover. 
They knew it was time for the Passover. Hezekiah being this good king, he says, look, it's time for this Passover. Israel, who's in the north, you and Ephraim and Manasseh, who's across the river, y'all come and y'all come to Jerusalem and let's keep the Passover that we're supposed to keep. If you drop down into verses 13 through verse 16, it says, and they're assembled where at Jerusalem much people to keep the feast of unleavened bread. So here's Hezekiah. He's restoring the, the, the Passover feast. Now then, here's a question that we can ask ourselves. Hezekiah is a restorer. He's a good king. He's trying to restore that which ought to be restored. How did he know how to do these things? How did he know to restore, how to restore the things that had been broken down? Well, very simple just like the way we can know how to restore our worship. Hezekiah, if you go into 2 Chronicles chapter 30, and in verse 16 it says, And they stood in their place after their manner, what according to the law of Moses, the man of God. In other words, what did, he, what did they do? They went back to the word of God. They went back to what God had told Moses. They went back to that which had been written for them to do. They knew what to do because they went to the Word. Now then, whenever they went to the Word, they were restoring what God had set up. Now then, here's some things that we ought to be able to learn. We ought to understand that we have, rest we have to have the restoration of the church today. Now then, I understand if you go back and you start, start studying, you can study about the Reformation movement, you can study about the Restoration movement, and you can, you can go back and see how that... Uh, that, that the church was restored through the restoration movement. Under the reformation movement, there were those men who didn't like the Catholic church and what was going on, and they had good intentions. They were wanting to get back to what was right. But instead of restoring what was right, what they actually did is they reformed the Catholic church, which brought about all these denominations. Well, we don't want to have a, a reform. We don't want to, to, to just change what's there. We want to restore. We want to bring back that which was in the beginning. And so for you and for me, how is it that we can learn some lessons from Hezekiah here in this restoration? Well, let's think about it. Whenever it comes to worship, Hezekiah restored worship in the temple. We can restore worship today. You know, so many people think about liberalism and antiism. And whenever we think about it, we think about it in the denominational world maybe. But liberalism is in the church. Antiism is in the church. The church of our Lord has gone astray. And whenever the church goes astray, then the worship is not what it ought to be. And what we need to do is we need to restore the worship. We need to make sure that we worship God according to His will. Go back and do a study on worship. There are six different Greek words that are translated worship. And each one of them is referring to something just a little bit different. And if you go back and you understand what those uh, six words mean and you understand about worship, we need to understand that worship is something that we do for God. Worship is not something that God does for me. It's what you and I do for Him. We need to restore that. You know, we've gotten to a point... In, in the society that we live in, we've gotten to a point to where it's all about what am I going to get out of it. Now then, how many of you, whenever y'all got ready to come to uh, the Summer Youth Series tonight, how many of you thought, well, I wonder what kind of uh, uh, snacks they're going to have. I wonder what we're going to be able to eat after we get through. How many of you thought it? Come on, be honest. You know, you thought about what am I fixing to get out of this, Right? You know, what am I going to get? What's there for me? That's not the point of this. The point of this is what can I learn? What can I do for God? What can I do for Him? Whenever we have to think about worship, we're thinking about doing that which God has commanded you and I to do. We think about what it says over there in John 4, verse 24. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. That means I have to worship him in spirit. That means 
I have to have the right attitude. I have to have the right thinking going on. I have to be correct with myself. But then I also have to worship Him in truth according to the Word. I can't put what I want in there. You know, we can't put uh, jelly and toast up here on the table because that's what I like. I don't like crackers. I want jelly and toast. We can't do it. And if we are going to be like Hezekiah, we're going to be people who are going to want to restore worship. And we're going to start worshiping God like we ought to, making sure that we've got our mind right, not thinking about, well, I'll tell you what, Mom and Daddy's got me coming to services this morning. And, you know, some of my friends, they're going off over here and they're going to the mall and they're playing this and they're doing that. And we think about that the whole time. Folks, your mind ain't right. Whenever Sunday morning comes around, restore yourself. Hezekiah was restoring worship. We need to restore ourselves and make sure that we're worshiping God like we should. Here's another thing that needs to be restored. Hezekiah restored worship in the Passover, and, and, and we understand that, but what's something that needs to be restored in the world today? I can tell you something that all you have to do is to go to one of the malls around here, and, and you may not even have to go to the mall. You might be able just to just go out here on the street corner and sit for a while and watch if folks walk up and down the street, and you can see things that need to be restored. One of those things that needs to be restored is morality. Morality needs to be restored. How moral are we? Are we immoral? You know, whenever we think about morality, we can think about a lot of things, the way we talk, the way we act, the way we dress, you know, the things we do. Morality can be involved in all those things. And we need to restore morality. You know, it's summertime, and everybody here is dressed good tonight, and, and I'm so thankful that you are, because if you weren't, I was fixing to bust you tonight. But everybody looks good. But you know what? Even in the church... There are those that whenever it comes to their dress, they don't know how to dress. Now then, I may be getting some of you anyway. You know how to dress when you come to services. What do you do whenever it's not Sunday or Wednesday and whenever you're not somewhere that you think the brother or sisters in Christ are going to see me, how do you dress then? Do you need to restore morality in yourself? Hezekiah he was a restorer. We may need to restore morality in our lives. We may need to restore morality in the church. What about restoring honesty? We need to restore honesty. You look over in the book of Revelation, Revelation uh, 22, and it tells us that liars are friars. You know, there's a little song that goes with that. Revelation, Revelation 21.8, right? Isn't that right, Abby? Yeah. All right, there's the song. We need to tell the truth. How many are willing to tell that little white lie so that I don't get in trouble, so that mom and daddy don't get mad at me? Son, what is it that you're doing there? Nothing. Well, you know he's doing something or we wouldn't ask in the first place. And then whenever you ask him, he says, well, you know, that's really not what it is. And he starts giving this line of stuff out of his mouth that you know is not making any sense. You know, I'm not very uh, techno technologically inclined. Uh, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't know that much about it. You know, folks nowadays, they got these iPhones and they do this number and this number and they blow all this. Me, I got one of them old flip phones, you know, that it's got buttons on it and you push it. And that's about all I do with it. I, I, don't, I don't do the technology real well. But I know enough about it that whenever they start saying, no, I'm not doing that. Well, I know that if you're going to say you're not doing something, but you're talking to somebody else, it's going to have to be some way that you're talking to them. And if you're not on the phone, the only other way I can think of it right now is either a two-way radio or a walkie-talkie or through the Internet. Oh, but it's not the Internet. We tell these little white lies so that we can keep out of trouble. We need to restore honesty. Honesty is the best policy. Is it going to mean that you might get in trouble whenever you tell the truth? You might. If you tell the truth, you sure might. You might get in trouble. But I don't believe you're going to get in as much trouble if you tell the truth. What about faithfulness? We need to restore faithfulness. You're here tonight. Maybe because you're going to be able to get them cookies and snacks here in a little while. Maybe that's why you're here. 
But how faithful are you the rest of the time? When the doors are open, are you there? Or do you find any reason or excuse that you can to say, I don't want to be at services? Well, you know, I caught my fingernail the other day and I ripped it down into the quick and boy, it is really hurting me and, and I can't go to services. But then Sunday afternoon, you're down at the mall with your friends. You couldn't go to services because you didn't feel good, but you can feel good enough to go to services. Maybe you were really sick. Maybe you felt bad. Maybe something was going on that you really did feel bad. But then all of a sudden, it's like as soon as the time chimes for the services to be over, boom, boy, I feel better. Mama, can I go to the mall now? If that same sickness won't keep you from going to the mall, if the same sickness won't keep you from going and doing the things you want to do, why is it that you let it keep you from coming to services? If you don't have a fever and you're not contagious, sometimes you're going to feel a whole lot better when you get together with brothers and sisters in Christ and worship God. It's going to help you to feel better. I know a guy <clears throat> that was on chemo and he had a bag that was that had a tube going into him and he strapped this bag to him and he would come to services every time the door was open. And I said something to him one time. I said, you know, I know you don't feel good and, you know, getting around with a walker. And I said, I know you just can't hardly get in and out. And he said, I can feel bad just as well here at the building as I can at home because he's going to feel bad at home too. You know, maybe sometimes we ought to restore faithfulness and be a kind of people who are going to attend services like we should. Hezekiah was a restorer. We need to be restoring things. What if it comes about things like benevolence, helping those that are in need? Here's one. What about giving? Young folks, and I'm not asking you to raise your hand because I don't want to put any of you on the spot. Really, it doesn't bother me, does it? Scotty, nah, it doesn't bother me. Put you on the spot, but I'm not going to. How many of you that have a job wait for mom and daddy to give for you? We're commanded to give as we've been prospered. Do we need to restore what giving is all about? Do we need to understand that if I'm working, that because I'm working, I now have a God-given obligation to give back to him part of what I've been prospered with? And you say, well, man, boy, I, you know, by the time I get through... Uh, I don't know, I make a car payment and, and, and I got to pay this for school and that for school and, and you know, I sure need them new shoes and, and, and I, I have to have gas for my vehicle because I got to be able to run around and see my friends and, and we got to be able to go and do and, and then you start naming all these things. Say, well, man, when I get through with all this, all I have left is just $5 and, and if I give any of that, boy, if anything comes up, I'm not going to have it. Let me tell you what, maybe what you need to do is you need to prioritize some of that money that's going out and change the way you think about it and start restoring the giving. You give out of what you've been prospered. If you make money, then you give first and foremost. And then what's left, then you take and you do all things. It means you may not get that new pair of shoes this week. Or it might mean you have to wait and go put them on layaway and pay them out over a period of a month or whatever else it may be. Hezekiah was a restorer. You and I, we may need to restore some things in our lives. Let's go to point number two. Hezekiah, let's think about a lesson we can learn from him in prayer. You know, think about the armies of Assyria. Uh, if you jump over into the book of 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 18 and in verse 13, in the 14th year of Hezekiah's reign, the king of Assyria, whose name was Sennacherib, he came against Israel. In other words, he brought war against Israel. Now then, Hezekiah, in trying to stop this, uh, this war with Hezekiah coming and, and coming against Israel, what Hezekiah decides is, is that he's going to send tribute money to Sennacherib in an effort to pacify him. In other words, I'm going to give Sennacherib this money, and if I give him this money, then he'll go on about his business and he'll leave us alone. And that's what Hezekiah was hoping to do. Well, Hezekiah did that very thing, but it didn't do what he intended for it to do because Sennacherib 
Even after he had given the tribute money, Sennacherib took all the fortified cities that were around Jerusalem, which is there in Judah. He took all the fortified cities and then he went and he went up against Jerusalem itself. And he had already been given these, this tribute. In essence, it was not enough for Sennacherib to have all the things that he had been given. He wanted more. Well, what more did he want? I can tell you exactly what he wanted because the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us that what Sennacherib wanted is that he wanted the people of uh, uh, God's people to stop trusting in the Lord God. That's what he wanted them to do. He wanted them to stop trusting in the Lord. But, do you think Hezekiah being the good king, do you think he was going to stop trusting in the Lord? Do you think he was going to stop trusting in the Lord? This is yes and this is no. How many thinks yes? How many thinks no? Raise your hand, everybody. He did not want to stop trusting in the Lord. Not only did he not want to stop trusting in the Lord, he wasn't fixing to stop trusting in the Lord. Whenever you drop down into the book of 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 through 7, and then we're going to drop down into verse 14 through 19, but in verses 1 through 7, Hezekiah, he sent some people over to Isaiah, the prophet who was the son of Amos, and, and he told him what was going home. And, and they said unto him, Thus saith Hezekiah, this is the day of trouble. In other words, we're in trouble, Isaiah. We need some help. What can you do? How can you help us? Well, it ended up that he was asking Isaiah, whenever you drop down in verses uh, 1 through 7 there, he was, uh, Hezekiah was asking Isaiah to lift up prayers for the remnant that are left. In other words, you lift up prayers for, for the rest of the people that are left here uh, in, in Judah. You pray for us. You drop on down just a little bit in verses 14 down through verse 19 and it says that Hezekiah prayed before the Lord. So Hezekiah prayed himself. Not only did Hezekiah want the prophet Isaiah to pray, but Hezekiah prayed himself. And whenever you get to the very last verse there, it says, Save thou us out of the hand that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord God, even thou only. That was part of Hezekiah's prayer. Lord, you save us and let people know that we're the children of the Lord. Now then, what happened? Well, God delivered Jerusalem from the people, of, from the hand of Sennacherib. Uh, and how did he do it? Does anybody know how, how Sennacherib was over, overcome, how the, Lord, uh, how, how the Lord overcame Sennacherib and the armies? Does anybody know? That's a question. Does anybody know? What if I give you the number 185,000? Does that help you? How does it help you? There you go. The Lord sent angels. Uh, the Lord sent angels. And these angels came and they killed 185,000 of the men of Sennacherib in one night. You get a gold star. The angels killed 185,000 men. Hezekiah's prayer was heard and it was answered because the Lord saved Jerusalem. Now then, think about this. Why did he do it? Hezekiah prayed. Isaiah prayed. Go back to the verse, verses that we read at the very beginning back over there in, in uh, uh, go back, well, I'll back up instead of Isaiah. Go to 2 Kings 20 verses 1 through 7. And, and what is it that was said in regard to Hezekiah's sickness? What was it that was said that Hezekiah did? Wasn't it said that Hezekiah did what? It says, and prayed unto the Lord, saying. In other words, Hezekiah prayed to God even whenever he was sick. What happened because of that prayer? Do you remember what it said whenever we were over there in, in Chronicles? In, in chapter 38, verses 1 through 8 there, and it said what? It said his years were lengthened by how many? By 15 years, right? Some of you are already 15 years old, and, and, you, and you feel like you're fairly old, right? Well, wait until you get as old as some of the folks that are here sitting towards the back. Then you'll understand what old is. 15 ain't that old. But Hezekiah was given an extra 15 years. Why? Because he prayed. Now then, Hezekiah got sick. He was near death. He prayed, <clears throat> and God gave him those 15 years. Now then, 
what is it that we learn from Hezekiah? We learn from Hezekiah here that prayer can change things. Prayer can do things that we don't understand. How do we know? In the book of James, James chapter 5, verses 16 through 18, it says, Confess, therefore, your sins one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The supplications of a righteous man availeth much. It, it, in it working, its workings, Elijah was a man of like passion with us, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. All this happened because of prayer. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 22 it says, And whatsoever we ask we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do these things which are pleasing in his sight. Because we ask, because we pray to God. Young folks, we need to be a praying people. <clears throat> Hezekiah was a praying man. We need to be praying men. We don't need to only pray during the time of worship. You know, there was a prayer led uh, whenever we were doing our singing. Uh, the young man back here led the prayer. Went right after we got, whenever we had gotten through with some of the songs and before I came up to preach, we had a prayer. We'll have a closing prayer. There'll be a prayer that's for the food that we're going to eat tonight. There's going to there's be all the prayers that go on tonight and at any other worship service, but that's not the only time we need to pray. We need to pray at other times than just that. Any meal that we eat, we need to pray. Ultimately, where did that food come from? God created everything that's in the, that is in the world and so everything that is here came from God. Shouldn't we thank Him for those things? Well, you know, I feel kind of embarrassed whenever I go into a restaurant and, and, and the restaurant's full and we sit down and, and, and everybody's just eating and, and, and we bow our heads to say a prayer. You know, I kind of feel conscious about that. Get over it. That's the best thing I can tell you. Get over it. Bow your head and pray. Does it have to be a long, drawn-out prayer? No, sir, it does not. It can be short and to the point. But ask God thanks for the food in which you're fixing to eat. I got three boys. One of them's 21, one of them's 15, and one of them's 11. And I don't remember which one it was. Which one was it to put, us in, put me in our place whenever we went to eat and we didn't pray one time? Was it one of them? I don't remember which one. We try real hard to pray uh, no matter where we're at if we're fixing to eat. But whatever the circumstances were, we went in and we sat down, we got our food, and here we go. We start eating. About that time, one of the boys, Daddy, we hadn't prayed. And I'm thinking, well, we're all, you know, it's my first thought. Hey, we're eating, just, just to eat, you know. That, that's really my first thought. But you know what? Just as soon as that thought went through my mind and it was a fleeting thought, boom, it was like, you're right, son, we need to pray. We stop eating and we say a prayer. People will respect you for it. If you sit down in a restaurant, most of the times if people are waiting on you and you and whoever you're with bow your head in prayer and they're fixing to come up and they're fixing to put something on the table, whether it be food or a drink or whatever, generally speaking, if they realize what's going on, they will stand back over here for a minute, wait and let you finish, and then they'll step up here and they'll go ahead and hand their stuff out and give it to you and then they're gone again. They're respectful of what, what it is that you do. You need to be respectful to God and pray during the time that you get ready to eat. You need to pray during the time of your meals. What about when you're sick? You know, most people don't have a problem praying to God when they're sick. When people get sick, one of the first things that wants to happen is, is people want to say, would you pray for my whoever because he's sick? You know, people don't have a problem with that. So-and-so's on his deathbed. Would you pray for him? I don't have a problem with that. It's good for us to pray for him. But what about when we're in good health? What about when everything is going our way and we're doing good and we're on cloud nine? Oh, we're just right where we ought to be. What do we do so many times? We forget to pray. We forget to say thank you to God because we're in good shape. Everything's going our way. Everything's good. And sometimes we forget to pray then. Young people, don't forget to pray then. You know, it, th these lessons are for you young people. You know, it, it's getting to the point that in schools that they don't want to say prayer anymore. And if you say a prayer, that boy, there, there's liable to be some problems. Now, we're from a little bitty community. Whole town's got 700 people. Now, y'all can't understand that because y'all live over here. But the whole town has 700 people in it. We know just about everybody. But the thing is this. 
is that at our school, the coaches, they still say a prayer. Now then, they're not Christians, but they still at least attempt to be religious and say a prayer or have some kid say a prayer before a football game in the locker room. You know, that's not a bad thing. The best thing that it'd be, though, is for a Christian to be able to say the prayer. But at least there is prayer may not do anything but hit the roof and bounce back to the floor. But at least there is a principle being taught. We need to say prayers. Hezekiah was a praying man. It lengthened his years 15. Because of Hezekiah's prayer, Jerusalem was, uh, was guarded by the angels. 185,000 of Sennacherib's men were killed. Because of prayer, what can happen for us? You know, providence is a wonderful thing. Hard to describe, hard to teach, I think. But providence is a wonderful thing. And prayer and providence go hand in hand. And whenever we pray, the providence of God does a lot of things for you and for me. Hezekiah was a praying man. We need to be praying people as well. Now then, let's go to point number three. And that is pride. You know, Hezekiah, even though he was a man that was a man of restoration, he was a man of prayer, he was also a man who displayed a measure of pride. You know, we think about what Hezekiah did. We find that, uh, you know, we talk about Sennacherib whenever he was praying and, and God overcame Sennacherib's army, and we understand that. But we find that Sennacherib, that after Sennacherib left, after he was defeated, and Sennacherib had gone away, uh, that what happened is, is that Hezekiah began to glory in the riches of Jerusalem, the riches that Jerusalem had. One of the sons of the king of Babylon and then, uh, came to Jerusalem to see Hezekiah in the wealth that Hezekiah had. Now then, this, this son of the king, his name was Merodach Baladan. And Merodach Baladan came from Babylon and he came over to see uh, Hezekiah. And whenever he got over here to where Hezekiah was at, in, in, in Isaiah chapter 39, verse 1 and verse 2, uh, it says that Hezekiah was, here's the part of pride, glad of them. There's Hezekiah's pride. He was prideful of what he had. You drop down just a little bit, and after Hezekiah had showed uh, Merodach Baladan, after he had showed what, what it was that Israel had, Isaiah comes and talks to Hezekiah. And he told him that because he did the thing that he did, that everything that they had, that Judah had, was fixed to be carried away. Now, if you jump down into Isaiah 39, verses 3 down through 8, after Hezekiah was asked by Isaiah the prophet, what have you said unto these men? Where did they come from? Hezekiah turned around and answered him. And one of the things Hezekiah answered and said, All that is in my house have they seen. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not showed them. In other words, Hezekiah was prideful of all the things in which he had, all the riches in which Judah had. And he said, I showed them everything that I had. There's nothing that they didn't see. Isaiah says, because you've done, you have done this thing, everything that you have is going to be carried off into Babylon. Now then, we've got to be careful with the problem of pride. Hezekiah was prideful. And because of his pride, after Sennacherib having been overcome by God, not Hezekiah, but after uh, Sennacherib was overcome by God, Hezekiah got prideful. The king's son from Babylon comes over and he's prideful about all the wealth that he had. And he says, look at what I've got. Not going to hide a thing from him. Because of it, he is going to be carried off. His pride caused problems. Hezekiah was, in essence, an object lesson of the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 18, where it says, Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Hezekiah is an object lesson here. Because his pride went just before what? The destruction. Everything was carried to Babylon. Not only was everything going to be carried to Babylon, but it also said in that same passage of Scripture that his sons were going to be turned into eunuchs. And now let's think about this. 
Hezekiah's pride caused problems for Hezekiah. It caused problems for Judah as a whole, but it caused some serious problems for his sons. Sometimes our pride doesn't just hurt me. It can hurt others as well. Now then, here's some things that we can learn from this whenever it comes to pride. There's some things that we can get prideful of that we better be careful about. Here's one thing for you girls. Don't become prideful of your beauty. Your long flowing locks. Perfect skin, don't have any blemishes. No white heads, no black heads. Got a good figure. And you think, boy, look at me. Let me tell you what. Pride can be your destruction. But not only for you, but for others. Because if you think that you're so great, you may look down at others because they're not quite to the same standard as you are. We think about bullying sometimes and bullying being with guys that bully others. It's the girls too. And it can be a form of bullying if you think, boy, I'm so great and she's not. And so we pick on her. You get in the girl's dressing room and you, you make fun of her and you tell her how ugly she is. And boy, she needs to comb her hair and you better do this. And, and you better buy this kind of cream because what you're using isn't doing you good enough. Let me tell you what, that's hurtful to them. But you know what? Lord, help us that it wouldn't happen. But what if you were caught in a fire? What might happen to that beauty? True story. I know of a young lady, long hair, pretty as you'd want it. Her daddy owned a farm. Daddy was out there building a fence. He had a digger, a post hole digger. I don't know if y'all know what a post hole digger is, and I'm not talking about them you do that like kiss and you pull it out with your hands. It goes on the back of a tractor on a PTO shaft and it goes round and round. You got a 40 horse tractor out there and it's going digging the dirt out of the ground. This young girl was out there helping her daddy. Long hair. She bent over. That hair got caught in the auger. Before daddy could get it stopped, it jerked it out of the top of her head. Now then, I didn't tell you that because I wanted that girl to get hurt like that. And I don't know if she was prideful of her hair or not. But if she was, it's gone now. Didn't kill her, but that hair's gone now. Half of it's gone. And if she had been prideful about it and had kind of held it over the other girls because, look at my hair. What do you think the other girls might do to her now? Hey, Baldy. You know, be careful. Pride goeth before destruction, Proverbs says. Young boys, you know, got some guys here look pretty stout. You know, you pretty stout? Come on now. Y'all, you know, hey, how many of you ever stood in the mirror and did, you know, look good, right? You know, let me tell you what, that strength's going to leave you one of these days. If you got brothers and sisters, if you're the biggest, and you're stouter than they are, you might be able to overcome them. But you know what? That means that you're going to get old before they do too. <laughs> they might overcome you at some point in time. Got three boys. All three of them, I've already told you about them, all three of them think that they're pretty stout. One of them, that 21-year-old, it hadn't been that long ago, he come up and he was going to show Daddy what for. Here he is. Daddy had back surgery a little over a year ago. And this boy, he's going to say, I'm going to boy, Daddy, let me show you what. Man, I'm pretty good. <clears throat> I said, okay, come on, boy. I said, just, whenever you're ready. Well, just as soon as he grabbed me, it didn't take but about that long, and he was on the floor. Sometimes we're not as strong as we think we are. But even if you are as strong as you think you are, that strength's going to fade. Pick on some folks here. Are you as strong as you used to be? Not even close. Neither am I. <laughs> uh, 
You know, the older we get, we lose some of that strength, don't we? We don't need to be prideful because we could lose that strength in ways that we don't want to. Think about these soldiers that have been overseas fighting. Would anybody say that they were weaklings? I wouldn't. But whenever they come back and they have a loss of legs, maybe the loss of their arms, maybe the loss of all of them, have they lost some of their strength? Yes, they have. I wouldn't want any of you to be in a car wreck to where it permanently hurts you, to where you lost your strength, but it could happen. Don't be prideful about your strength. Don't be prideful, girls, about your beauty because all those things, they're going to fade. Once you hit somewhere around 40, you're going to get what's called the Chester Drawers disease. Everything's going to fall. Boys and girls, don't be prideful because it can get to you. Here's something that happens sometimes too. Is it wrong to have a tan? Yes or no? It's not wrong to have a tan. You can even get a tan out of a bottle now. Go to Walmart and you can buy it on the shelf. You know, you can get a tan. There's nothing wrong with having a tan. But what happens whenever you get this beautiful bronze body? What happens then? You can get prideful of it. Boys and girls. Boys, you got these six-pack abs, you know. Tan, look good. Mm -hmm. What do you want to do? What do you think you might want to do? Go ahead, speak up. Let somebody see it, right? Girls, what do y'all want to do? Maybe let somebody see it, right? That goes back to that immorality we was talking about over there a little bit ago. But that pride of how you look, got this great tan, whether you bought it or whether you sweated for it out under the sun. Whenever you get it, the pride of having it may make it to where you lose your soul because you go out there and you become an immoral person because of it. I'd whole lot rather every one of you be white as a sheep, freshly bleached, than to lose your soul over immorality because you got a tan and you wanted to go out there and you wanted to show it to the world. Don't let your pride get you in trouble. Your pride can destroy you. And it might not destroy you today. It might not destroy you here on this earth. But that pride that may not destroy you here can sure keep you out of heaven. Hezekiah's pride destroyed Jerusalem. It can destroy you. Young people, Hezekiah, he was a good king. Don't misunderstand. He was a really good king. He, 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 brought, he brought about restoration. You know, he brought back true worship into the temple. For you and for me, that will make us think of John 4 and verse 24. We quoted a minute ago, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. It may ought to make us want to have true worship to God. We learn the lesson of prayer, how important prayer is. We ought to always have the mindset of prayer, not to say that we have to walk around like some people and have a prayer falling out of our lips, every word we say, not that, but we ought to always have the mindset of prayer. First Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 17 teaches, teaches us that whenever it says, pray without ceasing. Always have that mindset of prayer. But then Hezekiah had a problem with pride too. And we can learn a lesson from that. And that is Proverbs 16 and verse 18. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall. And we don't need to be destroyed because of our pride. Hezekiah let Jerusalem be destroyed because of his pride. Let's not let us be destroyed because of our pride. Let's learn these lessons from Hezekiah because Hezekiah was a good king and good lessons for you and me to learn from Hezekiah. Now then, the way I understood the summer series, it was would you vote for this man? Is that right? If you put Hezekiah up against some of the other kings of Judah, who would you vote for? I'd vote for Hezekiah. 
because Hezekiah was a good guy. He had problems, but we all do. We all have problems. The book of Romans says in Romans 3 and verse 23 and in Romans 6 and verse 23 that we all sin and come short of the glory of God. We all do things we shouldn't. But you know what? Even though we do those things we shouldn't, we have an avenue to have those things made right. And the avenue that we have to have those things made right is, is that if I am not a Christian, if I am at the age of accountability to where I know right from wrong what I should and what I shouldn't do, and I know that there is sin in my life, there is an avenue to get me forgiveness of those sins, and that is be obedient to the gospel plan of salvation through hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, and being baptized. God will add me to the church. And then by, by being steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, then I can know that I will have a crown of life waiting on me. But if I'm already a Christian, I have an avenue as well. I've had those sins washed away. Do you think that you hadn't sinned since you had them washed away? Go back to Romans. We're all going to do those things we shouldn't. So when we do those things we shouldn't, but I've already had them washed away, what do I do then? Well, James tells us to confess our faults one to another and pray one for another. If you've got something that's amiss in your life, you know, confess that fault. It may be a private thing. Make it right with God privately. But if it's something that's publicly, something that's known, publicly repent of it. Make it right with God. And whenever you do, then God will forgive you of those sins. Don't forget what it says in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 59, verse 1 and 2, where it says that sin is going to separate me from God. So if I've got sin in my life, then I am not with God. And if I die with that sin in my life, I will never again be with God. Where would I want to be? Do I want to be in heaven where there's no more pain, no more sorrow, no more tears? Or do I want to be in eternal condemnation where there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth? You have a choice tonight. Hezekiah is a good example for us to help make our choices. You can choose to be obedient to the gospel. You can choose to make your life right with God. If you have a need, we ask you to come while we stand and sing the song of invitation. We're dismissed. I do have um, a request to make of you. Um, the people who cleaned the building cleaned it last night, and so they're not going to clean it tonight. And so, what we're requesting is that you leave all your food in the fellowship hall, please. That's just down the hallway here to your left as you go out the back door. And uh, the young man who's lead of prayer, if you will, also pray for our food. Yes. Thank you, and uh, you're welcome. Well, 
Let's pray together. Our dear God and Father, we're so thankful for times such as this that we can be gathered together with Christians and uh, sing to you and pray to you and uh, have lessons from your word. And we're thankful for uh, men such as Jeff who are willing and able to come before us and present us with uh, present us with lessons from your word. And Father, we ask that you help help us to better be a, a people of restoration, uh, better be a people of prayer, and help us to avoid uh, avoid being prideful and Father, we ask that you uh, continue to be continue to be with each of us, help each of us to grow closer to you. Uh, help help each of us to be better examples, to be better servants uh, for those in the world that are around us. And at this time, Father, we are uh, we wish to give thanks for the food that's been prepared for us, and we're we're, we're always thankful for uh, all the things that you provide for us. And through Jesus' name, that we pray. Amen.